I'm grateful to be here. Appreciate the good lesson we just heard, Brother Bruce. It's so important that we recognize lectures today on apologetics. We're taught in 1 Peter 3 and verse 15 that we're to be ready to answer every man that asketh us, and always, that asketh us of the reason, hope, that's within us with meekness and fear. Answer comes from apologia, which may, means to argue your case and make a defense. Can you defend what you believe? You believe in God. Can you prove it? That is that he exists. You believe, as we just seen in the scriptures, to be the inspired word of God. Can you prove it? We just saw part of that being done. And then my topic is proving the deity of Jesus Christ of Nazareth or that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He is deity. So I appreciate much the church allowing me to be a part of this. And in reality, Brother Bruce, the approach I'm taking with this, you didn't really touch top side, bottom, or maybe, maybe the edge a little bit of um, what I'm going to do. I have gleaned this material from others. I don't claim originality. I do claim to have injected some of my thinking into it. But nevertheless, as all of us do, we study from others, we benefit from others. A lot of times in studying others, we have to weed out things they've said that's not right to benefit from the things that are right. But nevertheless, my approach to proving the deity of Jesus is going to be as if I were delivering an affirmative message in a debate that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. The next part is then that I will be seeking to prove that Jesus was raised from the dead to die no more. If I prove that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead to die no more, Jesus Christ of Nazareth is who he claimed to be, the only begotten Son of God, the only Savior of the world. And that tells me why he said to the Jews in John 8, 24, except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Also why he said, I am the way the truth of the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. John 14 and verse 6. We have to realize that when he said that, that was revolutionary in the world. We've heard it so much if you've been members of the church, or even if you've been exposed to the denominational world, they have affirmed that. So we think, well, that's just the way it always has been. No, it has not. And the people that killed him should have been schooled to recognizing and 1,500 years of the old law, which was a schoolmaster to bring them unto Christ. But they're the very ones, as far as the leaders are concerned, who took and crucified and slew the Son of God. As Peter said in the first recorded gospel sermon of Acts chapter 2. Now, so I'm saying that the resurrection, and here's the point, is a historical reality. Just like George Washington is a historical personage, or Julius Caesar <clears throat> is a historical personage. If I were to ask you, any one of you, or anybody living today, to tell me what George Washington's voice sounded like, you couldn't do it. In fact, you could not, uh, by those means, even prove that he walked the earth. But we do have lots of documents that have come down to us and that's how we know about George Washington, or going much further back than that, Julius Caesar, or Alexander the Great, or a great many other people. So, as a historian, one who studies events and people and situations that took place in history, and that means in past time and space, then I want us to realize that Jesus Christ was a real man who lived almost 2,000 years ago, and therefore that he died and he was buried and that he was raised from the dead. Now, we're realizing there are many people who do not claim that the New Testament is the inspired word of God. Well, I certainly believe it is. Preached it all my life as God's word, as the perfect law of liberty, as Bruch pointed out beginning at least in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all scriptures give them inspiration of God. But we're talking about apologetics. We're talking about making a defense, in my case, with proving, I want to score that word proving, proving that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is deity or the Son of God. So if Jesus was raised from the dead to die no more, and he was, then by implication he is the only begotten Son of God, 
He is deity. Our approach to this study will be to examine them, the historical grounds for belief in our Lord's resurrection from the dead. In other words, we'll take the approach of any scholar in history in reading any literature from the past to determine what transpired and why you can trust that literature. They have earmarks about them that says thus and so is true. Whether it's the New Testament documents that are actual ancient documents or any other document for that period or before that. We will focus on, first of all, Christ's empty tomb. And you'll see how we'll develop this. His resurrection appearance is next. And then the basis for his disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection. And here we must emphasize that proper faith requires adequate evidence and or credible witnesses. Faith is not just reaching the end of what I can know through my five senses and say, well, I'd like for that to be, so I'm just going to make that leap out there and assume that God exists. No. If your knowledge of God is not correct, your faith in God cannot be correct. Read 1 John. You'll see where he's talking about many times, hereby we know, hereby we know, hereby we know. He did because of evidence which he presented so that the brethren of that time could have the same fellowship with God that he and the apostles had. So he offered evidence. Faith comes by evidence. Evidence in the word of God. Now, also people may admit that God exists, but deny that God is the God who reveals himself in Jesus Christ. Today, this attitude is typical among many who believe in God. So many agree that God exists, but in our pluralistic society, it has become politically incorrect to claim that God has revealed himself only and decisively in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So what is it that Christians, and I say again as that term is defined and used in the New Testament, can offer to Hindus or to Jews or to Muslims for thinking that the Christian God is real and the only true and living God. And that's where I'm coming at on this matter in proving the deity of Christ. Now my answer to the question is this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to die no more. And that's exactly what Luke by inspiration records. And we won't say by inspiration here. We'll just say in an ancient document in the book of Acts records that Paul, the apostle of Christ, did on Mars Hill when he declared concerning God because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance unto all men and that what? He hath raised him from the dead. Christ not raised from the dead. Everything we're doing here today is ridiculous. That passage, uh, any passage from the scripture you study, it's to no avail. And anything we do that we call Christianity, as the Bible defines it, is worthless. Thus we see that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is God's own vindication of the extreme and radical claims that Jesus made concerning his person and his divine Authority. So how do, we, how do we know that Jesus is risen from the dead? Well, it's crucial that we be able to present objective evidence in support of our beliefs. Sometimes people sing, I guess it's because people like it and because it's a pretty little ditty. You ask me how I know he lives, and the answer is, he lives within my heart. Now, if you think for a little bit, you know that's begging the question. I have a good feeling. I've been told that feeling comes because God's in my heart, so I know he lives by that good feeling. That sort of reminds me of the Pentecostals who say, oh, I've had this great experience. They jumped benches, hollered and hooped and shook and everything else under the sun. And they say, that's the Holy Spirit doing that. And you can't tell me by a stack of Bibles that that wasn't God working in me. So they're not going to receive what the Bible says. 
It's all emotional. It's all subjective. There's no objective anything there. There's nothing. This is nothing but a declaration that one's good and happy subjective feelings proves that Christ is alive. Well, there's a whole host of folks. Anything from witch doctors to patent medicine salesmen to used car dealers that can give you that kind of testimony. I'm not interested in that. It's all emotional. All it proves is that I have that good feeling, and that's a good feeling I attribute to Christ. It's sort of like if, if you're holding a, a baby in your lap, and you have this warm feeling, and you attribute that to God, you might ought to look about the baby's diaper first. That's how much sense some of these things make among religious people who expect skeptics and atheists who go on pure reason to accept such stuff. When we seek to prove, and we are commanded to prove in giving this answer or our apologetics effort, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We must first prove that Jesus is deity, where? To ourselves. When you stood up before an audience somewhere, no matter how large or small, before you were baptized, you confessed something. You confess that in your mind, in your heart, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Now you can't make that statement honestly unless you can prove that because that's an affirmative statement. And you must prove it. And I'm commanded to prove it. So if we're going to engage unbelievers in private or public discussions, maybe it's letters to the editor, maybe it's Facebook, maybe it's on some blog on the internet or local newspaper or talk radio or our friends and family and so forth, students, then if you ask any of them ask you, well, how do you know he lives? Just tell them, I know he lives because he lives in my heart. See how far you get. It won't work, folks. That's not evidence. It's not proof. It's not objective. It's totally emotional. It is subjective. It's not doing what we're taught to do in 1 Thessalonians 5.21. So this holds no more water than the assertions of anyone else claiming to have a private experience with God. Thankfully, Christianity is a religion rooted and grounded in history, past time and space. It can be objectively examined. It makes claims that can, in important measure, be investigated historically. So we will then, in this study, approach the New Testament writings like the historian does, not as we know it is for other reasons, the inspired, inerrant, all-sufficient, final, and complete revelation of God to man, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, but merely as a collection of Greek documents coming down to us from the first century. We will not assume their reliability other than the way we normally regard other sources of ancient history. Now you may be surprised to learn that the majority of New Testament critics, and by New Testament critics I mean those who may not even believe in God, but they don't believe in the plenary verbally inspired as Bruce explained at the beginning of his lesson, a word of God that the Bible is. That is that the ancient language as God gave it in Hebrew and Greek is perfect and from God. All scripture, Theophanoustos, is inspired of God, given by inspiration of God. Yet, because they are, and Bruce brought this out, true to their scholarship, more than they are really to their religious beliefs or philosophies, they will admit that these ancient documents we know as the New Testament letters, and you could if we were talking about the Old Testament, do the same thing. They will admit they are truly ancient documents. And that means they have to treat them as such. And that means they have to investigate what they say as the manifestation of the thoughts of the men who wrote them. Now, they will admit that the things said about the resurrection of Christ in those documents is the case. Now just like people today who you can explain the plan of salvation to who claim to believe in God and Christ in the Bible the New Testament is the word of God they can't deny Acts 2 verse 38 but they're not going to obey it. So that's one reason these so-called higher critics 
though they admit these letters came down to us from old, and they can admit to the facts even of them, they have other reasons they do not obey it. So let, let it be emphasized that I'm not talking about denominational or conservative scholars only, but I am referring to those New Testament critics who are professors in secular universities and non-religious schools of higher education. Amazing as it may seem, when you begin to study them, most of them have come to regard as historical the basic facts which support the resurrection of Jesus Christ of the dead. Now let's look at those facts, the ones that we will examine this morning. We're proving that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was raised from the dead. Watch. The first fact, after our Lord's crucifixion, he was buried in a tomb by Joseph of Arimathea. I know that from these ancient documents. If you want to study about the life of Christ, you must study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There is a highly significant fact in this. Significant, I say, fact. Because it means, contrary to conclusions drawn by these radical critics, that the location of Jesus' burial site was known to Jew and Christian alike. If the tomb had not been empty, then the disciples could have never proclaimed Christ's resurrection in Jerusalem. Never. But they did, didn't they? How do you know they did? These ancient documents say they did. New Testament researchers have established this first fact on the basis of evidence such as we'll now look at. Jesus' burial is attested in the very old tradition quoted by the Apostle Paul to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 5. And I imagine every, well, he had to be a gospel preacher, he'd have to refer to it a lot, has referred to this over and over again as Paul reminds the Corinthians of just what they heard. But have you ever noticed how that thing is written? Paul is writing it as if something that he already knew had been said a long time ago. Now keep in mind that Jesus was a Jew in the flesh. That he knew all those traditions and cultural things, religious and non-religious, and that he knew how they worked and he operated that way. Here's what Paul said to the Corinthians. For I delivered unto you that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve. Now, such four-line formulas were typical of rabbinical instruction. Now, where did the church start? Among Gentiles or among Jews? It started among Jews. The way, and we do this today, we just don't realize we do it. We use all sorts of aids to help us remember things. We have a singing once a month, and we have at the beginning of that songs with the little kids. And we'll sing one that everywhere I've been all my life, and we've sung it, they all love it. In the Bible we find Dorcas was very kind. She was full of good works for the poor. She was sick and then died, and the widows all cried until Peter kneeled down on the floor. Tabitha, arise. Simon Peter then cried. They were happy, so happy, for she opened her eyes. You see, that follows this same line if you read it, because they're looking at things the way people wrote back then. That's what Paul's saying. You almost can put that to music if you listen to the rhyme that's in it. That's just simply studying literature of the times and getting very, very particular about comparative literature of how those people did. They weren't Americans. They certainly weren't Texans. So they didn't operate the way we do today. But that's one of the comments that you would need to note regarding the way they did those things. In fact, also concerning Paul, that's not even the style of Paul's writing if you read all of his epistles. That's not the way he writes at all. So Paul actually uses terms that were typical of the rabbis when they taught, such as received and delivered. 
This helps us understand something about the nature of inspiration. Mark was not an apostle. Thus he did not receive the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. How did he write by inspiration? It had to be through the laying on the apostles' hands whereby he received the prophetic gift and thus that's how he was inspired. Inspiration is not necessarily revealing new information but it is guidance of the Holy Spirit in selecting what you write and in what you write down that is just exactly no more no less what God wants you to put down and that every word is what God wanted you to put down. That covers inspiration. Now in this passage we see one of the ways as I said that scholars today, as we've just mentioned, have come to believe that Paul is quoting something that had been developed before his time as a Christian by teaching about the gospel. That's the way that an ancient historian who didn't believe in this as inspired of God would approach these ancient documents. He can't deny that they're not ancient documents. They are. Nobody tries to do that that I know of. At least the most and the respected ones, even though they don't believe in Christ as the Son of God, they will say these are genuine documents from the first century. Regarding the burial records, the gospel accounts tend to may, be made up of, of what we, well, you know, from your own know, reading, brief episodes of our Lord's life. And they are loosely connected, especially the book of John, and they're not always chronologically arranged. If you've lightly studied Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will see that. However, when we come to the suffering and death of Christ, notice this next time you're studying it. We have one smooth, continuously running narrative. Leave it today at some point. Just go back and read the narratives of the suffering death, burial, resurrection of Christ. You'll see that. Now most scholars think Mark is already the earliest gospel account and Mark's source for Jesus' suffering and death would then of necessity, as the Holy Spirit guided him, we would say in the church, would have recorded then these things earlier than anybody else. Comparing the narratives of the four gospel accounts shows that their accounts do not diverge one from one another until after the burial. This implies that the burial account was part of the account of the suffering and death of Christ. Again, its great age militates against it being legendary. And you'll see what I mean by that in a moment when I use that word legend. As a member of the Jewish court that condemned Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea is unlikely to have been a Christian invention. That should be rather obvious. So it's highly improbable, in other words, that Christians would invent a member of the court that condemned Jesus, but who honors Jesus by giving him a proper burial instead of allowing him to be dispatched as a common criminal. That's not the way people operate. It should be noted, and it must be emphasized, that no other competing burial story exists. Now let that sink in. Just think about that for a minute. No other than what the gospel account gives us exists. If the burial by Joseph is a work of fiction, then we would expect to find either some historical trace of what actually happened to Jesus' corpse or at least some competing legends. But all our sources are unanimous on Jesus' honorable burial by Joseph, a member of the very court that condemned Jesus. That doesn't mean that Joseph voted to condemn Jesus, but he was still a member of that court. It also shows you uh, what a touchy situation he was in to volunteer to do all of that publicly. For these and other reasons, the majority of New Testament critics, as I've defined them, concur that Jesus was buried in a tomb by Joseph of Arimathea. Folks, if that's correct, what does that cause a person to do to think about the other facts that are recorded? According to the late John A.T. Robinson of Cambridge University, and he was really no friend of Christianity or the Bible, 
The burial of Jesus in the tomb is, and I quote, one of the earliest and best attested, attested facts about Jesus. And I can give you the documentation on that. So, somebody has to deal with Jesus being buried in that tomb by Joseph of Arimathea. It's in that ancient document. If you look at it strictly as a historian, it's there. What do you do about that fact? Well, just hold that. Let's move to fact two. On Sunday following the crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty, and it was found empty by a group of his women followers. Among the reasons that have led most scholars to this conclusion are the following. The empty tomb account is also a part of the suffering, death, and resurrection that's found in Mark, if so be. His is the first gospel account. Which account did not end, now mark it, in death and defeat. In death and defeat but with the empty tomb account, which is grammatically of one piece with a burial story. It's highly interesting that the first recorded gospel sermon in Acts 2 is made very clear by Peter. He wasn't left dead, but he was raised. And where is he at the time Peter preaches? At the right hand of God ruling. So, hold that. Furthermore, the expression on the third day could be derived from the women's visit to the tomb on the third day in Jewish reckoning of course and that would be after the crucifixion the four line saying that we've already noticed from 1 Corinthians 15 as cited by Paul is a part of original apostolic preaching can't read it right now but write down Acts 13 and read 28 through 31, and you'll see why Paul referred the Corinthians to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, verses following. It's because that's what they preach regularly. They had to prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth not only had died or fulfilled those prophecies, they had to prove he was buried and that he was raised from the dead and died no more. Mm -hmm. Remove any of those, and down she goes. And we're affirming that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is deity and that you can prove it, not just have a good warm feeling about it. So the third line in 1 Corinthians 15 corresponds to the empty tomb account. In other words, preaching about the empty tomb is very important to those people. If he's resurrected, that tomb is empty. The account <clears throat> is simple, and it lacks signs of, as I said, legendary embellishment. Legends develop over a period of time to give people time to develop them. All we must do to appreciate this point is to take Mark's account of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and then go up to the second century and look at some of the most fantastic, wild, legendary stories found in what's called the Apophical Gospels in which Jesus is seen, in one case, coming out of the tomb with his head in the clouds and a talking cross following him. You don't see anything like that. But that's what it takes time to build these legends. The fact that um, women's testimony was discounted in the first century in Palestine in particular stands in favor of the women's role of discovering the empty tomb. Now, according to Josephus, the testimony of women was regarded as so worthless that it cannot even be admitted into a, Jew a Jewish court of law. So if they're developing a legend, they're not going to have women's testimony as the first ones who found the tomb empty. Any later legendary story would certainly have made the male disciples be the ones to find it. Because in their society, the women just were incredible in what they said, but the men were. But here God, as we see it in the inspired word of God, shows what actually happened factually. Who found the tomb empty first? It wasn't men, but it was women. 
The earliest <coughs> Jewish allegation that the disciples had stolen Jesus' body, Matthew 28, 15, shows that the body was in fact missing from the tomb. The earliest Jewish response to the disciples' proclamation, which was, he is risen from the dead, was not to point to his occupied tomb. See, they could have squelched the thing right in the beginning. Why, well, you say he's raised to the dead? Let's just go through the tomb, drag his body out, and we'll show you. So they would have laughed them off as fanatics. But they couldn't provide that body because the tomb was empty and the body wasn't there. Thus, we have evidence of the empty tomb from the very opponents of Christianity. We could go on, but I think enough has been said to indicate why. In the words of this historical scholar, Jacob Kramer, who's an Austrian specialist in the resurrection, and here's what he said. By far more exegetes could firmly or hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements concerning the empty tomb. In other words, most of them do. Yet they may not be Christians, but they're going on their scholarship and investigating ancient documents and the veracity of them. That was something they cannot deny. Well, that's fact number two. Look at fact number three. On multiple occasions and under various circumstances, different individuals and groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus alive from the dead. Now, this is a fact which is almost universally acknowledged among these New Testament scholars. And here's why they have to acknowledge it. First of all, the list of eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection appearances, which is quoted by Paul and what we referred to several times already in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 7, guarantees that such appearances occurred. Unless you want to say, they just lied. Now, if you say they lied, they knew they were telling a falsehood with the full intent to deceive people. Now, you made that charge. How are you going to prove it? These New Testament scholars, though they would like to be able to do that, they can't do it. They know they have to prove that they're liars. They can't do it. So these appearances included Peter, that's Cephas, the twelve, five hundred brethren, and then significantly James, the Lord's half-brother after the flesh. The appearance, traditions, and the gospel accounts provide multiple independent attestation of these appearances. Now mind you, we're looking at these letters from the New Testament just as Greek letters that came down to us like all other Greek letters. But they've got to deal with the facts recorded in them. So this is one of the most important marks of it being something that actually took place in past time and space or history. And you call that uh, historicity the veracity of it. The appearance to Peter is independently attested by Luke and the appearance to the twelve by Luke and John. We also have independent witness to Galilean appearances in Mark, Matthew, and John, as well as the women, and that's recorded in Matthew and John. Certain appearances have earmarks of historicity. And they have to apply these to whether it's the Bible documents as ancient Greek works or any other document that's come down because they're interested in the facts. They're interested, did this really happen? And they cannot ignore the rules they set up for the examination of those documents when it comes to the New Testament. Here's an example. We have good evidence from the gospel accounts that neither James nor any of Jesus' younger brothers, of course they'd be half-brothers according to the flesh, believed in him during his lifetime. There's no reason to think that the early church would generate fictitious stories concerning the unbelief of Jesus' family had they been faithful followers all along and before his resurrection. But it's indisputable that James and his brothers did become active Christian believers following Jesus' death. 
James rose to the position of leadership in the Jerusalem church. According to the first century Jewish historian Josephus, James was martyred for his faith in the late 1860s. There, some of you, I guess, have brothers. Now, I want to ask you something. What would it take to convince you that your brother is the Lord so that you would be ready to die for that belief? See, we don't usually think about that. But James was convinced, and he was convinced after the resurrection. Can there be any doubt that this remarkable transformation of Jesus' younger half-brother took place because, in Paul's own words, then he appeared to James. A fellow by the name of Gert Ladam, the leading German critic of the resurrection, himself admits, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Get to fact four, and I have to rush through this one. I only have four of them, so this is the last one. The original disciples believed that Jesus was risen from the dead despite their having every disposition of the contrary. All you got to do is think of the situation the disciples faced after our Lord's crucifixion. They had an imperfect knowledge of things regarding the Messiah and how he would save Israel and everybody else and so on. Their leader's dead. The Jews had no belief in a dying, much less rising Messiah. The Messiah was supposed to throw off all of Israel's enemies, mainly Rome at this time, and reestablish some kind of kingdom like David had, in which they would be over everybody else. Yet what was the condition at this time? He had suffered an ignominious, shameful death. The death of a criminal. And no Jew is going to believe that way, except you put together all of the evidences that are offered by Christ to prove he's the Son of God. According to Jewish law, Jesus' his crucifixion as a criminal showed him out to be a heretic. A man literally under the curse of God. Deuteronomy 21, 23. Cursed is the man hanged on a tree. Now I'm going to have to move a little further on this because I want to get down to the conclusion. I will note what N.T. Wright, an eminent British scholar, concludes. He says, That is why as a historian I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. To summarize our lesson, there are four facts agreed upon by the majority of scholars who have written on these subjects, which any adequate historical hypothesis must account for. One, Jesus' entombment by Joseph of Arimathea. Two, the discovery of his empty tomb. Three, the postmodern appearances. And four, the origin of the disciples' belief in the resurrection. So we come to the question, what's the best? What's the best explanation of these four facts? God raised Jesus from the dead. It's exactly what they are. If you look further, and I don't think time will allow us to do it. Well, got any time left? Okay. There have been rules made that have to do with showing the veracity of ancient documents. The affirmation that God raised Jesus from the dead passes all these tests. It has great explanatory scope. It explains why the tomb was found empty. It has great explanatory power. It explains why the body of Jesus was gone. It is plausible, given the historical context of Jesus' own unparalleled life and claims. The resurrection serves as a divine confirmation of those radical claims. It's not just a contrived thing. Evidence is involved. It is in, in accord with accepted beliefs. The claim God raised Jesus from the dead does not in any way conflict with the accepted belief that people don't rise naturally from the dead. The Christian accepts that belief as wholeheartedly as he accepts that God raised Jesus from the dead. And it far outstrips any of its rival claims in meeting conditions. I wish I had time to go further. But here's exactly how we conclude this. My hope, your hope of eternal life 
is based upon such facts as this. And our only conclusion, reasonable best explanation of these historical facts is that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was raised from the dead. You can take that to the eternal bank and it'll take you with it. Thank you.